And he looked at me, and there was this pause that seemed like an eternity. And he went, oh, I don't know why I'm doing this. All right, okay, you're signed in. <laughs> and and that, that was the moment I now realized, looking back, on, on which my entire life pivoted. It was the hinge of, of everything. And um, fortunately, I, 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 I was as good as my word. But the reason I picked Cambridge, this is the Ponzi pit, was that I had fallen in love with G.E. Moore and E.M. Forster and Goldsworthy Lowe's Dickinson and Bertrand Russell and Wittgenstein and the, what were then considered the progenitors and the big influences behind the Bloomsbury movement, and particularly with their cult of personal relations. Forster later in, in one of his essays got into some trouble for saying if it came to, a, and this was in reference to some of his friends, the Apostles, which was a group of Cambridge intellectuals, um, some of whom were people like um, Guy Burgess, uh, who, of course, was one of the Cambridge spies, the, the, the traitors. If you, uh, um, Forster said, if it came to a choice between, between betraying my friend or betraying my country, I hope to God I would have the guts to betray my country. And it's that, the primacy, the high doctrine of friendship and personal relations and an absolute instinctive distrust of causes and the abstract that I thought was part of a Cambridge that went all the way back to Cranmer and Latimer and Ridley and, the, and not that I was religious but the, those who were martyred famously in Oxford. Cambridge produces martyrs and Oxford burns them. And um, <laughs> <laughs> there is a martyrs memorial in Oxford to prove it. All the ones burnt there were Cambridge people. And, and, and it, 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 there was something about Cambridge that appealed to me. It was the, it was the mixture of rigour. I think after all the terrible things I'd done, um, the thieving and, the, you know, the, and the, the, the explosive disappointments of romantic love and, and physical love and all the other forms of love, agape and eros, um, uh, um, I just thought that I needed the discipline and the restless intellectuality and the... Um, the, 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 the refusal to accept the world that Cambridge represented. Oxford represents the world, and always has. It's really extraordinary how, going all the way back throughout the history, that Oxford was a royalist stronghold and Cambridge was a Puritan stronghold. And there's nothing attractive about it. I'm, I'm not saying for a minute that Cambridge is more attractive. Uh, in many ways, it's less attractive. That Cromwell was a Cambridge man, you know, and, and Oxford was the capital of King Charles's Stuart cavalier, uh, you know, it was his citadel. Um, and then, as I say, also previously before that, the, the Cranmers and, the, and, and, and others. And all the way up, Robert Hewison wrote a very good book called Monty Python, The Case Against. Um, he wasn't presenting the case against it. He was merely recording the opposition to Python. And, but, and he writes a very good chapter about the, the tradition in Cambridge of long, lean, sarcastic Cambridge people, as opposed to short, dark, rather more friendly Oxford people. And you can see it in Beyond the Fringe, there's Peter Cook and Jonathan Miller, as opposed to Dudley Moore and Alan Bennett, who are lovely. How could you not love Alan Bennett? And how could you not love Cuddly Dudley? And how would you not be scared by Peter Cook and Jonathan Miller? And then in the Python era, the same thing. You've got the lovely Michael Palin and the lovely Terry Jones, and you've got the incredibly sarcastic Eric Idle, Graham Chapman, and John Cleese. And he says, you know, the average Python meeting would be Terry Jones and Michael Palin saying, let's have some pantomime Princess Margarets. And John Cleese would go, why? <laughs> and <laughs> that, that tension, as it were, and, and actually you can even go further forward. You could say, well, Richard Curtis and Rowan Atkinson are a lot more lovable than that awful Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry, for example. <laughs> uh, dance. Darts. Oh, now you've got me going. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I, 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 a couple of Mondays ago, I, an ambition of mine was fulfilled. I, I sat next to Sid Waddell, who is the voice of darts, the, the, that Geordie commentator. Um, Tell us, the, Stephen, the, what he sounds like. Well, he said, <laughs> total eclipse of the darts, he said at one point, <laughs> which, which was very exciting. And I was able to come back with Bonnie Taylor because um, um, <laughs> Phil Taylor is the, probably the greatest sportsman alive on the planet. You may question the use of the word 
sportsman next to a dance player, but um, he is 15 times world champion. He has broken every possible record. I don't think that any other sport in the world has a, has a, has a 15 times world champion. I find dance an absolutely captivating spectacle. And I think one of the things that's most captivating about it is this unspoken, or indeed sometimes quite boldly spoken fact that people think there is a massive disconnect between someone like me enjoying uh, the gladiatorial arena of this extraordinary game, which is performed by rather tattooed working class people. And they therefore think either I'm being like some of those Regency bucks who used to beat up the watch and go, rah, rah, you know, how funny, let's watch some working class people beating each other to death. Um, or, or, or that I'm patronizing, or that I'm trying to be cool. Or, but it is, it's nothing to do with that. There is this unwritten British embarrassment about the fact that darts is an, it's a pub game and it's a working class game and it is a very male game, it has to be said. But, and it's obviously not attractive to see large, overweight, sweaty men with tattoos, except for the fact that they are so good at their sport and the scoring of darts is so exciting that you get fantastic games. And I was able, as I said at the time, I, uh, on live television, so I had to be careful, I'm like a pig in Chardonnay. And um, <laughs> uh, it was, uh, <laughs> that's how I felt. Uh, I know it's odd, but there you are. Um, Martin Amis, uh, after all, uh, do you remember um, uh, uh, London Fields, uh, one of his very best novels, if not his best, I think. It's a really a marvellous book. He writes about darts really well. Eros. Ian? Eros. Oh, Eros. Yeah. Oh, saw backwards by no, no accident. Um, um, no, hang on. Um, <laughs> um, it's also an anagram of rose. Um, too late. <laughs> too late, you're right. Um, yes. Um, when, when you're a child and you, you watch films on television, you, you, you tend to wonder why it is that the, the action, the comedy, the adventure stops every now and again for this bewildering, baffling nonsense that is eros, that is love. Um, and then when you pass through child into adulthood, there's a part of you that sometimes questions why there is any other subject in the world. It is all there is to think about and talk about love. It is, of course, uh, everything within us. And it, the extraordinary thing about, and of course there are many shapes to it, the Greeks, uh, I, I, I alluded to a couple of them, agape and eros, but there's philos, and there, there are many others, Greek words for it. There, there are many nuances of, 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 of love. Um, and we know how important it is to us, and so much so that we don't even think about it, um, because um, because we, we sort of almost couldn't couldn't carry on living because of how important it is. And our dreams often tell us this. Uh, it's it's fascinating how how often one dreams about a moment of love or someone one has loved or, or lost or or unrequitedly loved um, will come back 30 years later, and you think, oh my God, I'm not still, am I? I am. And I remember seeing a, a, a man of 106 being interviewed uh, on television on his 106th birthday. He was in, in Norfolk and he was the oldest man in East Anglia, which we were very proud of. And, uh, and the interviewer said, um, is there anything um, that makes you unhappy about being old? Is it, you know, do you, all your friends? He said, well, it's not my friends, but he said, I, I still miss my mother. And I thought, wow, of course, of course you would. My mother, I'm happy to say, is still alive, but, but I'm sure I'd miss her, and I'd miss my father if he went. And there's no reason why one shouldn't. If you love someone, you love them forever. It doesn't, you know, just because the, the string is cut by Atropos, whoever, whichever, that, whichever it was of the ones who, who cut the string of one's life, um, it doesn't mean that your emotional concern is cut. And, you know, love is... Uh, is just, um, it's overwhelming. And, and I remember when I was um, first uh, involved in things like Stonewall or, or gay rights or whatever, and I was asked to speak at a parliamentary thing for Edwina Curry, of all people, who, um, for all that one may um, much mock her, she, she was the one who, uh, who put in a private member's bill for an equality of an age of consent.
stop, stop. Oh, you have. No. <laughs> uh, this is Stephen Fry. <laughs> Um, we are going to invent an alphabet, and I'm going to make some of it up, and Stephen's going to make some of it up, and we're going to need you to help us with some of the letters. But we're going to start with... Uh... <laughs> we're going to start with ambition, Stephen. What is it that you would most now like to do? Now, it's very hard to answer. Um, I... Uh... I, I have a theory that is very unpopular in America, that, um, that the worst thing you can ever be is goal-oriented. Um, in, in America, it is taken as a sacred truth that the first step towards self-fulfillment and success is to set yourself goals. Um, and, and I think that that is the most disastrous thing in life you can ever do, partly because if you miss your goals, you hate yourself and you feel a failure, and if you hit your goals, you are bound to be astonished by the fact that they don't bring any level of happiness. So you, you, it is, it's just looking in the wrong direction. So I don't, I'm not sure what I'm ambitious to be. If I said I was ambitious to be happy, that would sound very dull. Um, I, you know, as, there's no one I am ambitious to go to bed with. There's no one I'm ambitious to uh, meet necessarily. I, I'm, I'm, I, I suppose it's just what I'm ambitious for is not to turn into a, a bitter, angry old person. I'm now 52, and if there's anything in the world that upsets me, it is um, it's that kind of, I hate this, I hate that. that you know, when you see newspapers saying, why this is terrible, or people saying that something is crap, or, uh, and, um, and those programs like Grumpy Old Men, you know? I can't, I just... It's, it's just so easy. It's a lot of, I mean, it, people I like, Arthur Smith and Will Self, are bright and clever people, just pretending to be angry about things. That, and, and I would hope that as I got older, I got more and more accepting of everything, so that if, say, in 30 years' time, there's a modern equivalent of Lady Gaga, I want to think that I will say, tunes are so much better now than they ever were. All things are better than they ever were. They may not be, but they're almost certainly not worse. But something happens to you as you age that makes you convinced that they're worse. And I hate that something. I think it's deleterious to the human spirit to believe that your island of youth was somehow privileged and blessed as better, richer, more, more fulfilling, more artistic, more creative, more innocent. All of that is really a result of uh, sentimentality of the wrong kind, false memory syndrome, and, and a lack of historicity. Because if you look in history, people have always said that. They've always said it. And, and I think the best ambition anyone can ever have is to get younger as they get older, to be more accepting and to be less closed. That's what I would hope for. B is for both. Oh, thank you very much. Bees for... Bees for bored. What makes you bored? Oh, bored. I mean, you work at a higher speed than almost anybody I know. So what, what holds you up? Um, bored. I'm, I suppose it, it's very interesting being in the public eye. Um, it relates to ambition. If you'd said, what, what, what was I ambitious for when I was a teenager? I've recently had to accept that when I was between 17 and 25, if I'm honest, I was desperate to be famous. I really was. And I know now that we are all supposed to pay lip service to the idea that fame is an illusion, a snare, a terrible rainbow that people chase that will only get further away. It's not the substance of what it is you should be doing, that the, the modern culture of celebrity is a, is a terrible thing. But, nonetheless, when I was a teenager watching Parkinson, I, I wanted to jump into the television and be part of this glamorous world of extraordinary people. I, I fantasized about being stopped in shops and asked for an autograph. But what I did not fantasize about was a world that, and oh, how, how just it is that I should suffer from it, a world that I've welcomed, the digital world, has now means that unlike when I first did become quite well known, 
everybody now has a camera. And if you want to know what bores me, <laughs> it is at a signing queue for a book, for example. Um, it used to be fun to be able to go and what's your name and where are you from without sounding like the Prince of Wales, which is a challenge. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, but to fall into a, a conversation is really good fun. But now that's impossible because the moment someone arrives at the queue, they're looking at the person next to me and going, would it be all right if I had a photograph? And it's not only that they have a camera, whether it's in the form of a phone or a digital camera, it's of course, they want to be in the picture. So they're giving it to someone else. And that person is like someone who has never seen a reptile being given a chameleon. <laughs> What, so, ugh, how do I, huh? It's just, oh, oh, I've turned it off, I think. It's, it's, if I could have back the hours in which I have gone, oh, get on with it, for f sake, get on with it. If, if I had that back, I would be very happy. So that is when I am maximally bored, if maximally can be considered an adverb. Uh, Cambridge, what kind of, what kind of transfer was that for you? It, it was a very extraordinary thing for me, and um, what I'm about to say will sound about as poncy as you could ever be, um, but it, being this, as this is a literary festival, maybe it's allowable. When I was 17, I got arrested by the police, um, which I wrote about in my first autobiography, and, and I went to prison. And when I emerged, I emerged from a custodial sentence, as, as it were, a custodial period, with two years probation. Um, and my parents were understandably at the end of their tether, and they, they were, they'd been amazing, uh, considering I'd run away from this and I'd been expelled from schools. And, um, and so when I arrived back home on, on, on probation, I said, I want to do some A-levels. I'd run away from so many schools. And, you know, I'd done my O-levels when I was 14, because in those days you did. Um, if, you know, if you well, no, consider. most people didn't at 16. Yeah, so but I mean, just a lot no, I mean, if you could. People, I mean. Yeah, all right, yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, and so, but then I seriously kind of screwed up every other opportunity. So um, they said, well, if you, it's fine if you really want to, but it's up to you. They, you know, they said, we're, we're no longer going to do it. So I knew that Norwich City College, which is like a further education in, establishment in Norwich, did a one-year A-level course. So I... I I went, literally, the day I got back from Puckle Church, which is the name of the prison I'd been in, which sounds like a beautiful bed and breakfast somewhere <laughs> in, in the Lake District. Welcome to Puckle Church. But it was, in fact, it was such a hard place, it got shut down. It had riots. I used to get called up by the newspapers to comment on it, like an old boy you know, talking about his school. <laughs> <laughs> well, it never happened in my day. But, <laughs> but um, uh, anyway, so... There was this queue, and it was the second day of registration for this college, and I was really at the end of the queue on the second day, and I got there, and there was this little man, and his name was Peter Butler, never forget him, he had silver hair and bright blue eyes, and um, he said, what, uh, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do A-levels, um, I want to do English, French, and History of Art. He said, oh, I think there may be a one place left on French, but the other two have gone, you'll have to pick something else. I said, no, no, those are the ones I want to do. And he said, well, I've just told you, they're oversubscribed. So I looked at him and I said, if you let me do these, I will get A grades and I will also get a scholarship to Cambridge. You, you must let me do this. 